Maggie Bowman was the series producer. Gordon Quinn is the artistic director of Cartem Quinn, but also the executive producer on Hard Earned. And Liz Carr was the co-director and co-editor on the entire series. Wow. <laughs> I, it's funny because this is the third time I watched it and I thought that I would be able to watch this without crying but that did not happen. So <laughs> there's always this moment where it's like the emotions sort of take this ride. Um, I would like to jump in right away and say where did you find those amazing characters and how long did it take you? It took us longer than we <laughs> thought it was going to. Um, it, we found them all in different ways. So the first one that we found was Amelia and we, um, Ruth Lightman, who directed that story, and I had been meeting with different groups in Chicago, and this group called the Restaurant Opportunities Center introduced us to Amelia. So they were the ones who sponsored that fine dining class, mm -hmm. and so they said, choose someone who you know is, sort of has an interesting story. Um, Hilton and Diana, that was that was took a much longer time. It took months actually because there were a lot of different <coughs> angles. Joanna Rudnick, the story director for that living out in the Bay Area, we were exploring a lot of different angles. And um, it eventually became clear that a service worker in the tech industry would be a really interesting way to look at that developing economy. Um, and so through some community groups that led us to some other Google employees, led us to Hilton. Um, but it was a combination of um, you know, different, a lot of different conversations with hundreds of people around the country. and some people that we would talk to who maybe would be interested and then would kind of, you know, get a little scared. It's not for everyone to mm -hmm. be in a film. So we, needed, we knew that we needed to have someone who was kind of ready for the journey. And, I mean, I think in Hilton and Diana's case, Joanna, actually, we had started with someone else. That's right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with DJ and Takeda, I mean, Maria had been all the way to middle Indiana looking for people, and it took took a long time and often what constrains you sometimes it's the people and their concerns sometimes especially with low-wage workers it's access to the situation so that there are reasons why they can't get in a film or something would they would be put at risk by being in the film and even with the characters we had we had to confront some of that so it's a complicated process. Yeah, for example, the, the other story that Joanna had started following was a security guard mm -hmm. who worked as a contractor in Silicon Valley. And there was an interesting thing going on. Security guards have been organizing um, uh, a union out in that area. Um, but the, for a variety of reasons, we couldn't film him in his uniform, and there were some things we couldn't film him at home. And it was going to be really hard to tell the story without seeing a security guard in his uniform. Was that, I mean, did that happen more often though? I mean, did you start off with more characters than we actually saw in the film? Because you have five characters, five directors, um, and six episodes. And I was wondering if that was something that you had planned all along, or did the process change as it <coughs> went along? So to shorten that question, where did that process start? I mean, at the beginning, what was the idea? Early on, it was going to be six um, stories, one per episode. And then Al Jazeera, which commissioned us to commission Kartemquin to do the piece, um, said, you know, we think it would be better to have it interwoven. And we said, we totally agree. It would be a lot more compelling. It's a lot more challenging to edit. And Liz can talk about mm -hmm. some of the editing challenges of weaving those stories. But um, so part of the way that we made it work within the budget and the schedule was to go down to five stories. Um, so, the, and I don't, we did a couple of other test shoots with other subjects, but most of the, the vetting of the subjects was kind of through a lot of conversations before we actually started, or sometimes, you know, Skype interview or in-person meetings, things like that. But that, it's, a, it's on the business side, really, but often we had told them from the beginning, yes, of course it would be better interwoven, but that costs a lot more money, blah, blah, blah. So then when they came back at us, we were like, well, you know, it's going to cost money. more. We want more money. And so then to make it work, we took something out. What did you take out? Well, what I'm saying is we took out a story. <laughs> oh. it, what, story. what Maggie story. just described. Yeah, but, but we I'm hadn't saying, found mm -hmm. the stories yet, so it wasn't like we were, like, you know, nixing one so of them. So it's almost like you decided, okay, now we have five. Let's look for our five characters. It wasn't nixed That's after right. you started. That's right. We always knew from the beginning because we had, mm -hmm. we had five directors, and each of them was going to 
find a story that they would follow. So the five directors, and this is something I think where Liz comes in too, because that in terms of a process where you are the series producer, what was that process like? I mean, did um, you're also working in different locations. Were you looking for characters in specific locations? Did that just happen? Um, and then how often were you coming back and meeting at the mothership or, you know, we're back at Kartemquin? Do you want to? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so there were five story directors and I'm a co-director of the series. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we definitely wanted it to be a Nash, a, a portrait of the situation nationally. Um, I mean, we have three Midwestern stories, but we also have two coastal stories, and I think that's important because it's a, a national issue. Um, and how often did we meet back at the mothership? Well, so this, <laughs> to answer your question about did we find the stories, and that mm -hmm. we found the directors first. So these are all directors who have mm -hmm. a relationship with Kartemquin, who have made other films with Kartemquin in the past. So um, they basically were looking in their areas for the most part. Maria is in Chicago, and that's she was go going to. We were looking for an Indiana story and couldn't find it. So. In the end, then she did a Chicago story as well. So we all got together in, um, we, we would have some kind of like Skype calls, and then we had a really great story summit in October where everyone came together. So that was um, David Simpson, who was the other editor slash co-director with Liz, the three executive producers, which was Gordon, Justine Nagan, and Steve James, the five directors, myself, and two co-producers. And so it's a really big collaborative team. Mm -hmm. So we all got in the room for one day. We brought some experts on the issues in. We spent the morning kind of just familiarizing ourselves with some of the issues around low wage work. And then, and there had been some stories that had already been researched. So then we spent really a good amount of time kind of figuring out what are the, what are the ways in which we want to tell these stories. And Gordon, maybe you want to talk about the idea of the the um, the style guide and the way that we talked about kind of trying to find some uniformity across the way that we film these. I mean, we had done a series before with the New Americans, so we actually uh, did more than I anticipated, we, partly at, at Maggie's urging, and we actually put together, uh, you know, shooting guides and things because we were going to be working with camera people that were not used to mm -hmm. working with us, so that the kind of look and feel of it would be the same. And also on the technical end, I mean, if you get one of the nightmares of New Americans is we had footage coming in that was at different frame rates and all kinds of nightmares caused. Some of it was shot in India. And so we were able to control pretty much everything that came in, both technically and the look and feel of it. And we had some really interesting camera workshops then where the, the people who are going to be our main DPs and also even the, you know, the PAs, so every crew was basically a DP, a sound person, and a PA slash DIT. And the, um, so we, we had a workshop because we really needed a very clear protocol for how to handle the media. And, and also then, but part of that workshop was talking through kind of some of the basic principles of shooting verite documentary that Gordon has been working mm -hmm. with for 50 years. And so to be able to kind of bring everyone together and talk about, you know, you might do it this way in some cases and this way, but on this film, we're not going to have a really shallow depth of field on interviews. We're going to have like a, someone really shot in their environment so that you really get a sense of the work. So those were a lot of the conversations we were having to make sure that you couldn't, that you weren't, didn't find it jarring to go between stories. One of my mantras, because uh, I was an editor before I was a camera person or director, was people listening. You know, uh, the, the scene that Jose shot brilliantly, I mean, he's shooting with mm -hmm. his camera, and it's Elizabeth, when they're buying the ring, it's all her. He doesn't even appear on camera, and most of it, so it's, you, you just, it's important to have people listening and their faces, and a lot of times when you react, react emotionally, it's not to someone who's talking, it's to someone who is, you see it on their face when she gets cut off and she's, her hands are, you know, she's alone in the, in the space and she's not saying anything, but the emotion is there. Yeah, uh, going off that, as an editor, my favorite camera people are the people that follow the emotion of the scene, and that's exactly it. It's, it, it might be the person in the back row listening, you know, and showing something on their face, and it might be um, other things. Yeah. I mean, the really great thing was having David and Liz working while the footage was coming mm -hmm. in was that they were able to give feedback. So both like sort of, you know, 
okay, let's ask this camera person to do something a little bit differently in the future, or wow, that was an amazing scene. And then we would, David and Liz and I would sit around and talk about some suggestions for other things that could go out and be shot, and we'd have those. So we were having like weekly calls mm -hmm. with the whole group, but also a lot of calls with, you know, let's talk with Katie and let's kind of brainstorm. So it was intense having the footage coming in while they were editing, but I think you would probably agree that there was a real strength to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. How early on did you come into the process, Liz? Because this almost sounds to me, and it you know doesn't always happen like that with documentaries, where your pre-production process, beyond the research and you know looking for the the subjects and and establishing time and trust with them, this is actual like we're going to do camera tests and we're going to figure out a look and style of the film. So how much time do you think you spent on that, and what was your role there? Yeah, uh, David and I were actually attached to the project from the very beginning, and so we were involved in the story summits and, and you know, the camera workshops and that type of thing, uh, which I think was great <laughs> uh, to have um, access to the experts, but also inform the process from the beginning. And um, I mean, editors uh, <laughs> bring bring to it a kind of uh, shrewd, um, uh, perhaps rigidity for like we want certain things and we will ask for them. Um, and so we were we were doing that from the beginning, and I think that made some of the the process uh, easier as it as it could, went on. Could you give us an example of? Sure. One of the <laughs> uh, yeah. Totally. So we would want certain coverage of a scene. Mm -hmm. um, also, we would want interviews. You know, you you. Um, Ask, have the subject ask the question back in the beginning, and, and um, you know, and you know, we were working with incredibly um, experienced directors, so of course they were going to do that. But I mean, other things too, just like you know, we could see, you know, this this would be a great transition, you know, this would be a great moment. Can you make sure to get it? That type of thing, or like we really need this this interview. Um, for instance, um, Jose and Elizabeth buying the rings. Uh, we were like, we really need you to go back and interview them about what was going on emotionally uh, as that shopping experience was happening, because um, that really added more context and emotion to the scene. That I remember a one thing that we kept reminding people was this is happening around the country. This is happening in certain kinds of communities, and we need to see that in terms of the look and the feel. We need to see the trailer park. You know, go back and shoot the trailer park. We need to visually see where they are, or Montgomery County. We need to, need to understand visually that that is what the second most expensive county in the U.S. or whatever it is. So that was a thing I know that you guys were constantly wanting those. Just simple things that it's like not there in the footage. And if your team is all dispersed, then it's a lot harder to push for it. And I think that's the key is that it was a dispersed team. I mean, um, you know, in, in most cases that, you know, the directors are, are constantly looking at the footage and they, they know that it's missing and they'll go back. But because this was such like a buttoned up centralized operation, which it had to be, um, there was a lot of communication back out that we needed certain stuff that was missing. There are also some ideas um, about, okay, let's have some tropes that we film in all of the locations so that we know that we have you know, we really made sure that we had everyone kind of waking up early in the morning mm -hmm. so we were able to cut the some of those things. The brushing of the teeth. Yeah, the brushing <laughs> of, yeah, and some of those things happened. We didn't really even plan that. That's just the beauty of that. But um, yeah, it definitely, we would, we were trying to always, the, the best part about having these stories intercut was that you can see similarities and also it brings certain differences into relief. Um, so having them side by side, there was a lot of we were thinking a lot about how to shoot them in a way that would bring that out. It's also, you know, there are moments that are so intimate in each of the stories, and they're very different kinds of intimacies, but, you know, I see DJ and Takita, and they're both sitting on that red couch, and it's just this moment between the two of them that you forget that the camera is even there, and building that kind of trust and that kind of, you know, creating that kind of intimate moment takes time. How long were you filming with each of the families? And um, I mean, I know that you weren't directly there in that, you know, as one of the teams, but how was that trust established, if you can talk to that? Well, it was a shorter period of time than, like, let's just compare <laughs> it to The New Americans, which was mm -hmm. how, how many years was we, The New Americans? We, we shot for almost a year on, you know, we were in 
before you know before the I mean we were editing too but we shot for a year on most of the stories yeah yeah I mean some of them went longer the Pal Palestinian story when 9-11 uh, happened we had to be back with our Palestinian family that day and so yeah but so like Hoop Dreams was shot over what six years or something like half, that well four yeah uh, four and a half years and then we spent two years editing it yeah <laughs> so a lot of Kartempwin films happen over a really mm -hmm. long period of time and we were setting out to make a six, basically what's a six hour movie in a year, which was pretty terrifying. Um, and and it, was, it was sort of terrifying at times. But, um, no question about that. Yeah, um, but I would say that we, the very first shoot we did was with Amelia in October of 2013. And then we wrapped principal photography in May of 2014. Wow. So, and then there were some pickup shoots, mm -hmm. like I think, even as late as maybe November, there was like a little pickup shoot. But yeah, th most of the footage was shot over like a six month period. That is pretty short. I mean, in terms of how much we're seeing, we're seeing them at festivals, we're seeing them at holidays. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, it spans the, the gamut. Mm -hmm. um, how often were you filming with them? I mean, were you living with them at that point or? It, it varied once again by each story. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, when it was really interesting thinking back when we first talked about it, we thought it would be a certain number of shoot days per story, like maybe 22 shoot days. And somehow early on we thought, oh yeah, we'll just go shoot for three weeks straight. Well, that was totally not going to work because first <laughs> of all, their lives would not unfold that quickly in three weeks. And also, no one would want us around for three weeks straight. So those days just kept stretching. Then we thought it was going to be a three month period, but it just became clear because you're just, mm -hmm. also they're very busy. Hilton had like one day off a week. I mean, working 85 to 90 hours a week. And at the very beginning, Hilton said, I, I don't really know how you're gonna do this. I I'd like to be in this, but I only have Sundays. And so Joanna was there, you know, and she'd be there when he got home at midnight. She'd be there when he got up at five in the morning. So it was, working around their busy schedules was extremely challenging. But I think the, the, particularly with this series, but in general, the reality is you, it, you look at it on the screen and it seems like we were living there. Uh, but it's really building the relationship and knowing when not to be there and when to be there and stretching it out over time then gives you a story arc. Um, so you don't have to be there every day. You have to, part of the challenge for the directors is to know what's the day, what are the situations which are gonna, where something's gonna happen on an emotional level. And that's, that's the key. That, knowing when not to be there too is, is a really challenging thing. And that came about through the, just those personal relationships between the directors and subjects. Um, some of which, you know, like Ruth still, she'll spend a couple hours a night mm -hmm. on the phone with Amelia talking. They're very, very close. And so she has, she's very deeply in tune with when Amelia was kind of like, we, today we can push her a little bit and then you know what, we just cannot because she's, she's actually really had it with the camera being around. And we had some real challenges. I mean, there were some stories in which we really, you know, one of the characters who was critical would sort of withdraw and did not want, seem to be, want to be in the film anymore. And then we had to kind of get involved in that and see if it could be worked out. But there were definitely so there's some drama behind the scenes uh, on the filmmaking front that does not appear in the series. <laughs> How um, and and again in terms of I, I'm sort of the going back and forth between process and then relationships and then the editing and deciding this is what else we need. How often did it happen where you saw things that you expected to unfold and then how often? Or were there any situations where you're like that? We did not expect that at all. And how do we deal with this now? There, yeah, there was a lot <laughs> of unexpected. I mean, it was like very hard to predict what was going to happen. And their, their lives are very dynamic, at times chaotic. Um, it's it, their lives were pretty intense. So I don't know, Liz. Maybe you can speak to that from kind of just watching the footage, because you would see things unfolding. I mean. I would know oftentimes before we, seeing the footage, you know, I had heard from one of the directors what had happened, but 
you were probably seeing seeing things unfold in the footage. Yeah, I'm not sure if I was ever surprised that it was happening, because um, I've worked on enough films mm -hmm. where things just tend to happen if you follow people long enough. I mean, I was overall surprised at how much happened in their lives. I mean, just, you know, Jose and Elizabeth, they got married in the course of our filming that you saw. That, that was definitely unexpected at the beginning of um, when we started off. But I think what really hit me is, like if someone filmed me for six months or something like that, it would be pretty boring. My life's pretty, pretty <laughs> much the same. But I think what the reality is, is if you're living on low wages, your life is, can be very precarious and you're kind of living on, on a precarious cliff edge. And I think that creates drama, which is, um, I mean, unfortunate, <laughs> you know, for, for the people living it. But the reality is, is for us, it, it created, you know, arcs, but um, yeah, that's something that definitely hit me, that when, when you don't know where you're, you know, if, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you don't know how you're gonna make ends meet, sometimes things get really rough, yeah. I think one of the, the things too, um, while watching the series, I mean, it, I just had this moment where I was like, you know, it would have been so easy to follow families that had minimum wage jobs and tell a story of workers who were living paycheck to paycheck in a very, very, the, the, even their basic needs were not being met. But the characters that you have, you actually have characters mm -hmm. who are making what would traditionally be considered a middle class wage or mm -hmm. income. Elizabeth and Jose, for instance, I mean, she's yeah. making 54,000 a year, which most people would say, well, that should be comfortable, but it's not. And it just is heartbreaking when they, when they talk about their their in, entire day and it's they never see each other and it's like yeah. how do you how does that happen and that's something I mean this isn't even a question but that's something that I just loved about the series that that hard earned was actually relatable on so many levels yeah and the interesting thing about Jose and Elizabeth is they're living in one of the most expensive counties in the mm -hmm. US outside of Washington DC so you know they have to make it stretch a little bit more but also they're you know, both uh, sets of the parents are immigrants and that, you know, Elizabeth is paying her parents' mortgage and she's the first one to graduate from college and so there's like so many different layers going on in that family that I think is really interesting and in kind of their pursuit of the American dream. And we, that, yeah. we just considered at the beginning, do, are Jose and Elizabeth, do they belong in this mm -hmm. series? You know, they've, you know, like you said, Elizabeth makes a decent wage and one of the images that, um, Katie Chevigny, who directed that story, came up with early on is like, we are seeing people on the on and off ramps of poverty. So some mm -hmm. people who are kind of declining, they had been doing well, like Amelia, mm -hmm. and, and things are getting worse. And Jose and Elizabeth have a foothold in the middle class, they're trying to move up, and we're waiting to see if it's gonna be possible. And one of the things that we think about, I think, in a lot of our films, and when we're looking for a subject, if you were doing it for the news, they would find those minimum wage workers. And it's like, life is more complicated than that. The reality of low wage work is more complicated. So we always try to dig a little deeper. I think we knew from the start that we didn't want people just making minimum wage. And even, um, you know, DJ and Takita's story where they're both working at Walgreens, but he just has this ambition where he's, you know, he's, he's not, um, settling for what that job means and you know seeing it further is definitely interesting it just the, the the characters definitely come out through through the entire series um, I know that you you know this is the fourth screening that you've had for for the well the first for this episode but mm -hmm. the fourth screening mm -hmm. so far and it sort of you know makes me think of this campaign that you have so it's playing on, it's broadcast, uh -huh. but at the same time you have these series planned, including one on May 31st, which uh -huh. is the, the, the finale. Yeah. Um, how are you, you know, how are you finding those audiences or where are you targeting those particular screenings? And, and sort of what's the impetus behind that? Yeah, well, because it's available on exclusively on Al Jazeera America, which is a cable channel and not everyone is a cable subscriber or even if they are, they might not have the tier, the, the tier that includes Al Jazeera. So we wanted to both give other people an opportunity to see it and also to engage with some communities that um, are affected by the issue. So our our like premier event was, was held at SEIU Healthcare, which is the Healthcare Workers Union, and it was great. It was a great combination of 
the filmmaking crew <coughs> and um, union members, and we had a really great discussion, and DJ and Takeda and Amelia were all there, and so it's just been interesting to take it, you know, it's, it's really great also seeing it with the filmmaking group, and especially so appreciated seeing it on a big screen, which is one of the things with the TV series that you're not, you don't often have the opportunity to see it on a big screen, so that was really great, and the projection was beautiful. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, um, it's been interesting, but we're having also a lot of conversation on social media around each broadcast, mm -hmm. so really good exchanges on Twitter and Facebook. Um, people who are watching I this year. The Storify. Yeah, we did a couple too. of Storify <laughs> summaries of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I notice that what's happening a lot with even on Twitter is that people are noticing the way the characters are being portrayed with the dignity, and that that's something that you know Amelia talks about in the episode itself. Is like you know, some people when they look at you, they they think that you're a servant or they they talk to you a certain way. Um, how difficult while putting the story together was that? Was creating these characters that are multidimensional and yet, you know, we can feel what they're feeling. It's like I could feel, you know, my, the, the, the hair on my arms raise when certain things happened. But also, I mean, you brought in the graphics, you brought in text. There were moments where you wanted to give us more information. So where did that process fit in? Was that something that you were also working on as you filmed or did that happen in post? The graphics part? The graphics, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the major, I mean, we always knew that we wanted to include infographics, um, so we were definitely <laughs> thinking about it uh, in the pre production, but I think um, it really grew out in the post process. Um, and we really wanted uh, them to be organic to the scene, and so you'd be watching it. And for instance, like Amelia and the, the minimum wage for tipped mm -hmm. workers, you know, it really comes from you are engaged with the character and then the information comes out of that and that was really important to us. And I think in, in finding our characters, you know, and people who were reluctant to participate and even people in the process who we were having issues with, nobody wants to be portrayed as a victim. And it's pretty much a core value at Cartemplin that you can talk about people going through incredible hardship and also give them their dignity. And that comes through the complexity, the multidimensional. Uh, it's not in this episode, but one of my favorite moments is just a little quiet moment between Jose and I guess his niece as they get into a little argument about whether the milk should be thrown out mm -hmm. because it's out of date. You know? And it's just those, that complexity and respecting your characters is critical, I think, to getting people to empathize with them and not sort of say, oh, those poor people. That's not mm -hmm. the, what we mean by empathy. What we mean by empathy is that thing where you understand, you feel because you felt those things in your life. And so I think by the end of the series, I mean, even some of the people who we were had the most concerns, I think when they come to these events and when they see this, when they saw it finished, they were like, oh, now they get it. Yeah, and as an editor, when I watch all of the footage, say like three hours for one scene, people are making jokes all the time, you know, and it would be untrue to the reality of them as a character if I just tried to portray it as sad or, you know, it's like, it's just real people. And for someone, a friend did say uh, something about being sad after watching it, and I said, redemption is coming, <laughs> stick with it, I promise. <laughs> so I'll tell that to all of you as well. Yeah, it's, it's really, um, you know, I want to ask what's happening now, but I know that there are three other episodes that you should all watch, yeah. <laughs> so we can't quite give away the, um, the details for those. But we have a few more minutes, and after that we will be opening to Q&A, and there are two microphones um, on the sides, so if you do have questions, coming up to the microphones and asking those would be amazing and great to extend this conversation. Um, Part of, and, and this is again one of those questions, you mentioned budget earlier. What would the budget be, and at what point did you decide, okay, well, because you mentioned this a little while ago, Maggie, where, you know, finally now you're off the clock. So how does that work with a series like this? Is that something that you're negotiating as the process is going on, or have you decided that early on that this is? Part of the proposal, so the, genesis of the project was that Al Jazeera approached Cartemquin. They were a new network, they were looking for a lot of new content, and they were approaching filmmakers around the country. 
And so they approached us about making this series. And then um, Gordon and Justine put together a proposal that included a budget. And so a lot of back and forth through that proposal and fine tuning the budget. And once the project was approved, that's the budget. And it's we're incredibly fortunate to work on a project that's commissioned, which means that they provided the whole budget. Um, once that budget was set, that was it. So we had to get very creative when we were changing the parameters. Um, you know, it, the whole project stretched on many more months than we had anticipated, and um, you know that was just a lot of kind of okay, where can, we can borrow from this line item and fill in that line item, um, and we we managed to make it work. We. Mm -hmm. Came in under budget. You can make the <laughs> amount of the budget. Yeah. So the, oh, the total budget is 1.8 million for the. So they and in TV world they kind of think about this as like how much per episode. So for them it's actually, you know, that's a that's a pretty good way of getting a lot of bang for their buck to do a multi episodic series. Um, whereas if you just they also. Um, acquire one-offs, but all of the commissions that they've done at the network have been for, you know, multi-episodic series, and I think for them that's great for a lot of reasons. One, they can bring in viewers week after week, but it's also, it's, um, you know, to make six hour-long films would cost a lot more than that. We do have one question, I believe. Yeah. I can't see you, but go on. <laughs> There we go, there's yes. a light. Um, okay, so uh, one thing I noticed uh, during this episode, and I'm sure obviously all of them, is that there was this wide range of uh, ages amongst the people that you followed. Was that something from the beginning that you were really wanting? That way it could be that much more relatable um, all across the board? Yeah, I would say definitely. There were a lot of sort of demographic groups that we were trying to represent, but age was like pretty important to us and um, interestingly we had some conversations early on with the network of the, the, the couple that you'll meet in episode four, Percy and Beverly, who are in their mid-60s. Um, we were always really committed to telling the story of older workers and um, they, because networks tend to think about younger viewers, they, they were a little resistant and um, we were, you know, luckily we were able to convince them this is a really important story to tell. Um, because there's a lot of ideas out there that people think that low-wage workers are young people and that those are people who have their first job. Um, so we wanted to show that this cuts across all age groups. Thank you. Was there, you know, going off of that too, I mean, how was it working with Al Jazeera in terms of this back and forth process of what you wanted and what they expected or, or wanted from the, the project? I would say for being a, a series that's commissioned where they do ultimately have editorial control, um, it was great because they were really ultimately not that heavy handed. It really did feel like a collaborative process. When you make an independent film, like which you know many of Cartemquin's films have been um, gone on to public television and often with those funding situations, you have copyright, you have creative control. and so. We didn't have that, but they really gave us a lot of latitude. I think there were, you know, there were a few bumps along the way. They're a startup, and this is our first time working with them. But I would say, I don't know, Gordon, if you want to speak to it at all. But I, I think for the most part, we feel like compared to other like commercial cable networks, we had it really good. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they they also were new and in a lot of turmoil and they didn't have a lot of time to really pay a lot of attention to us, which turned out to be a pretty good thing. But I, I think the underlying principle is you're always at risk when all of your funding comes from one source, and that's the situation we were in here. With the New Americans, we had, you know, at the end of the film, all the funders go by, and we had this incredibly long list, and that gives you a lot of leverage, and we have that in a lot of our films. Uh, you either have editorial control or even if you don't have editorial control, uh, no individual funder is in a position to, to put that heavy heel on you. So, but I think, you know, the, the biggest problem for us, and that's why we're doing like we're at an event like this, is that Al Jazeera is on cable. They're trying to build their audience. And for complicated reasons that have to do when they bought current the channel that they you know and then they became Al Jazeera America 
that they can't stream anything. And so there are real limitations to what they can do that are frustrating for us because anytime we do a big project like this, you were asking about it at the beginning, a whole part of what we're thinking about as the series is being conceived is the outreach and engagement. And we have national campaigns. We would have events like this all over the country and be thinking about who are the organizations and the par partner organizations. So with this series, we have a little mini piece of that happening here in Chicago. Uh, but you know, we would raise separate money for it and all those kinds of things. Yeah, if we had a full outreach budget, we, we have, you know, there's so many communities that this series could could get into and could be a part of really great conversation. So, um, yeah, there's some foundation out there that wants to give us money to do a proper outreach campaign. We, we would absolutely... You wouldn't say no. We wouldn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> so we have one more question, Theo. And um, for the rest of you, too, please definitely come to the microphones if you have questions. They're right there. Uh, You'll have a spotlight, too. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. I, for one, don't have Al Jazeera, so uh, I've been really uh, wanting to see this for a while now. Uh, my name is Theophilus Jamal. I'm a 2015 Diverse Voices in Documentary uh, Fellow, uh, along with Kurt Temkin and uh, Chicago Filmmakers. Uh, filmmaking uh, workshop. Uh, my question is geared towards Liz. I know that you co-directed one of the segments. Would you please share with us uh, a typical, you know, uh, what a typical day was like on, on the set uh, for shooting this particular series? Sure. So I um, was not one of the story directors. I was a co-director of the entire series, which means I was um, kind of at central command with, with Maggie and Gordon. So we had five different story editors that were out there in the field shooting. Story directors. What? Story directors. You said story editors. Oh, but, sorry. Yeah, yeah story, story directors. <laughs> they mingle okay. after a while. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then they, they um, would send the footage back to, to home base. So I didn't actually spend any time on set. Um, but uh, May Maggie went on, you, you did something. Yeah, I went out on a couple of shoots. Um, I think the interesting thing is that because in documentaries, um, a lot of the film is coming together in the edit room. So that was because the directors were out in the field shooting and they were sending their footage back. And then David and Liz and I, with help from the executive producers, were crafting the story. Um, that, that was why the role was editor and co-director for Liz and David. Um, was there, what, what did you want the audience or any viewers to take away after watching this? Um, because I think it was like extremely entertaining to watch and I went, I had a lot of emotions going on and um, I think these people definitely deserve to have their stories told. But I'm just wondering like what you wanted people to take away after watching it. Like did you want them to do anything or feel anything in particular? Well that, you know, that's the piece in a sense that we would be looking at if we had a really big outreach campaign. I mean, on one level, just what you said, these people have their, deserve to have their story told. We need to understand the range of people and the range of struggles that are going on in, in America. Uh, in another film that we made about Roger Ebert, the first words in the film are Roger Ebert saying, the movies are this great machine for generating empathy. So we care a lot about getting you to empathize with people who may be different from you. We think that's one of the powerful things that film can do. And for at Cartemquin, we think about what's our niche, you know? There's advocacy films, there's, you know, feature films. There are all these different things that are out there. There are people who make very polemical films. Uh, I love Michael Moore, but we don't make films like Michael Moore. And we think of our niche is getting people to care about and empathize with people who are different from them and to reach out to people who maybe don't share the, you know, like should the minimum wage be raised, whatever the issue is, they're not on necessarily the progressive side, but we feel that we can open them up to another way of thinking. So that's really what we're looking for. And, you know, I think Sometimes someone in another one of our movies once said, you know, I, I, I feel something. I don't know what it means. Maybe I'll know months from now. 
And that's what we're looking for. That's our audience. That's our, you know, that's what we want. Not necessarily somebody's going to go and do this right now. Well, that was actually a wonderful way to even end this conversation. <laughs> um, but if there's anything else that you would like to share with us or, or let the audience know, then this is the time. Yeah. <laughs> Meg. Well, yeah, I would just encourage you, if you have cable or if you have friends who have cable, make them invite you over and watch it. Parties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's also now available if you have a um, subscription and you can log in online. You can watch... If you're a subscriber, you can watch the episodes online and get caught up. Um, and then we're also having this big celebratory event May 31st at the Chicago Cultural Center. And all of the subjects are coming from around the country. So it's going to be really great, and all the filmmakers will be there. So we're looking forward to that. And then you can just check our website, harderinseries.com. There are a couple of other public screenings coming up. And there's some, uh, if you, go, there's like an explore page, and you can go. There's some great resources to go dig a little deeper on some of the issues that are introduced in the series. And I can leave you with my infographic that I put up on the bulletin board at Cartempwin. This kind of also speaks to your question, what do we want people to do? It was a pile of pennies, and it says, this is the amount of money earned by full-time minimum wage workers in, in 2014. And it's $14 billion. And then there's a pile of bills piled up much higher, and it says, this is the amount of Wall Street bonuses in 2014, $28 billion. So the reality is, is that our tax policy and the incredible inequality that exists in our world take away half of the Wall Street bonuses, which people don't need and don't earn. And everyone making a minimum wage now could be making $15 an hour. And actually living. Thank you.